New York City is rich with historic taverns, pubs, and saloons. Sadly though, many have closed in the past few years, and as they disappear, so too does their unique and important history. Luckily for travelers who want to know New York City better, there is still a collection of amazing places to visit for a drink and a trip through time. We'll start in the Financial District, at 54 Pearl Street, at a place that's been serving the public since 1762. Anyone who says you can't find America's history in a bar has never been to this place. Actually, they've probably never been to any of the places we filmed, but I digress. Anyway, this is Francis Tavern, the oldest drinking place in all of New York, and one of the oldest tippling houses in the entire country. Aside from its longevity, Francis has also had a very significant place in America's history. We're lucky enough to catch up with the museum's education director, Jennifer Patton. The building was originally built as a mansion, as a luxurious house for the Delancey family. Stephen Delancey was one of the richest uh, residents of New York City um, as a merchant. And so he started building it in 1719. Um, however, once it was completed, they, no, they never lived here. Samuel Francis purchased it in 1762 and he opened it as a Queen's Head Tavern. Considering that it was originally built as a mansion, it was a very large tavern compared to most of the other taverns in the area. So um, he was able to use different spaces for public dining, for private dining, um, and meeting spaces. The long room was the most uh, important room for special occasions to be rented out. Though simply a tavern, the Queen's Head was also an important place in its community. Because you come to a tavern, you find out what's happening in the community. There would be broadsides or newspapers posted there that, um, that you could read yourself or would be read aloud to the room because many could not read. And this is where you're finding out about new laws being t passed, new taxes happening, um, different announcements of escaped slaves or chairs for sale or a new play happening. This is where you're learning all. It's the message board in Starbucks. I mean, basically, that's the same idea. Sam Francis himself also attracted people with certain ideals about the country, the rule of England, and about forming their own nation. He definitely sided with the patriot side, the rebel side. So the tavern reflected that, um, that many patriots would come here and sort of talk about different ideas of of breaking away from the British government. New York was very was very divided. They had a lot of loyalists, a lot of patriots, a lot of people in the middle, and taverns reflected that. So there would be loyalist taverns and, and non-political taverns, but Francis Tavern most definitely was on the patriot side of things. In those turbulent days before the revolution, Francis Tavern also frequently served some of the most notable men of that time. Before the Revolutionary War began, um, different Notable people, John Adams and George Washington, most definitely were frequented here. And the tavern also had a part in Evacuation Day, the day that the English left New York, signaling the end of the war for independence. So on November 25th, 1783, this is Evacuation Day, when all the British leave uh, the harbor, or they get on their ships and start to leave, and George Washington parades back into the city with his officers and soldiers, and actually a um, a large party was held here at Francis Tavern, hosted by Governor George Clinton in honor of Washington's return. The party was lively and occupied the entire building, not just the ground floor. George Washington himself made 13 toasts of hot buttered rum to everything from the American army to the kings of Sweden and France. General Washington also used the long room on the second floor to bid farewell to his officers before resigning his commission and heading back to Mount Vernon. So this is the room where George Washington said farewell to his officers. It was a very brief occasion. They did not sit down and have a meal. He really? basically just gathered them. They believe it's about 40 in attendance. Um, this is right before he will be going to resign as commander-in-chief of the, of the Continental Where's Army. Over? At its very core, Francis is also just a tavern. Remember that they drank back then, just like we do now. People drank a lot. Spruce ale was very popular. For more luxurious taste, Madeira wine was a huge uh, import from the West Indies and different parts of Europe. Rum, once it also a big um, import from the West Indies. 
While it stopped really being a colonial tavern in the late 1700s and it fell into disrepair, it was bought by the Sons of the Revolution and restored. Now it houses museum space and galleries on the second and third floors, while using the ground floor as tavern space, just like Sam Francis did. I don't want to say that they continue the tradition of serving volumes of alcohol like they used to, but this place has four bars stuffed into it. The tavern is currently run by the Porterhouse Company from Ireland, and they offer space reflective of colonial America. They also offer a huge assortment of beer, whiskey, and a full kitchen. In all fairness, the real Francis Tavern ceased existence 220 years ago, but what stands now is a reminder of where we were from. Look, we're not Quakers. We didn't arrive in the New World and drink distilled water. We drank beer and rum and Madeira wine and anything else we could find. Sam Francis Tavern is a great reminder of that past. Like a little kid yelling, Look at me! Look at me! The place begs you to explore our history at every turn. And if you care at all about where we came from, you'll delightfully let yourself be taken in by it. With any luck, the people you came in with will have to search the whole building for you, only to find you in the flag gallery, contemplating the symbols used 240 years ago to free our country from tyranny. It's not often you can contemplate these things and then retire for a drink. Francis Tavern is one of those few places that truly brings our past alive. We turn now to the Bowery. This area of New York once comprised the eastern border of the slums known as the Five Points. The city's poorest of the poor lived here, and so what followed was crime, gangs, and of course, saloons. It's here we find our next stop. Sitting comfortably in the shade on East 7th Street in the East Village of New York City, it's one of the most iconic historic bars left in the United States, McSorley's Old Ale House. Someone once told us you could teach a high school history class in McSorley's Old Ale House, and he was right. This place is like an informal history class where the bartender acts as teacher and guide. And to guide us through the bar's history, we talked to Pepe, who's been at McSorley's for over 30 years. This was one of a million places in this part of town. In 1854, you couldn't fall down in this neighborhood without falling into a tavern, a bar, a pub, or whatever. This is the Bowery. The Bowery was bar after bar after bar after bar after bar. It was the worst degenerate place in, in the whole city. It was because the Bowery is synonymous with uh, bums, vagrants, out of work actors, you, know, you name it. And uh, this is one of the few that survived. And it was in this Bowery that Irish immigrant John McSorley chose to create his tavern. John McSorley was born in 1827 in County Tyrone, Ireland. He immigrated to the U.S. like thousands of his countrymen and women in 1851. Within a few years of his arrival, he opened up a tavern called The Old House at Home. What's amazing about this story is that we can speak about the place as something that's still here. Oh sure, there are other old bars around, but they've changed names and owners and even identities. But the magic of McSorley's is that it hasn't changed a thing. But how is that possible? Why did Survive for a lot of different reasons. Luck? Across the street, there's a new building right now. Mm -hmm. It's part of a school called Cooper Union. But back in the 1860s, there was a building there called Tompkins Market. And they had a huge roof. And it was part market, part drill area. Mm -hmm. Meaning the soldiers would drill on its roof. I mean, do their whatever, drilling or whatever soldiers do. and. Uh, the 69th Regiment was called back from the Civil War to protect this neighborhood because they were having draft riots. Draft riots were people who couldn't pay their way out of fighting in the Civil War. Some people paid their way out. They called them draft riots. The poor couldn't pay their way out. So what happens? They start uh, looting and burning and rioting. Abe Lincoln calls uh, the 69th Regiment back. We're lucky because they're right across the street. The rest of the neighborhood goes up in smoke. Wow. And that's just one example of why we're still here. And nothing in the place has changed. Nothing. They hang a picture, it stays there for a hundred years, or longer. Abraham Lincoln stands on a chair for a rally, they put it above the icebox, stuff it full with a bunch of other stuff, and it stays there for, you guessed it, another hundred years. And take these wishbones. The story goes that John McSorley would give an ale and turkey dinner to soldiers going off to war. They hung them up as they left, and when they returned, they took their bone down. 
So those hanging belong to the guys who never came back. They're still there, hanging on the gas lap like the days the soldiers left. Everything in this joint should be in a museum. And in truth, it kind of is. People wander in, buy a couple of ales for admission, then they sit down at one of the small, ancient, scarred tables scattered throughout the tavern, and they examine the exhibits around them. And speaking of ale, that's all they serve here. Two kinds, light and dark. John McSorley sold only his item, his product, uh, his work. When he turned his place over to his son, William, John found out that William introduced liquor. Because everybody was selling liquor. Uh -huh. John came back, fired his son, took the place back over. Next, you know, and said, I don't want you selling a liquor. I want you, if ale's not strong enough, then, uh, you know, you can't work here. William got rid of the liquor and uh, he worked here for 65 years afterwards. Their motto used to be, good ale, raw onions, no ladies. That's right, since their founding, McSorley's has been a men-only tavern, and they were fiercely proud of it, denying even one of the owners of the place, who happened to be female, entrance until Sunday night after they'd closed. But that changed August 10, 1970, when the National Organization for Women won their Supreme Court battle against the bar, and McSorley's was thrown open to the gentler sex. Luckily, the walls are still standing and the sky didn't fall. In fact, McSorley's is even more popular as a result and now is perhaps the destination bar in New York City. As we said about other places, there's just too much history to cram into this program. We could talk about the sawdust on the floor or the 150-year-old original bar. We could talk about JFK's original death certificate or the paper announcing Lincoln's assassination. We could talk about these things all day because there's just so much history to this place. But the best thing to do is come here and see the bar for yourself. Buy a couple of ales for entry and spend half a day just looking at the walls. Talk to Pepe or whoever's behind the bar at the time and enjoy one of the U.S.'s landmark bars. Next, we head southwest, where we're just a stone's throw from the Hudson River. Built sometime before 1812, this small, three-story building at 326 Spring Street houses some of the most notable living history left in New York City. You see, much of our past, the past that has to do with what really shaped our nation, our neighborhood bars, has faded away. We've tried our best to preserve them through these programs, but 326 Spring Street, also known as the James Brown House, is living, breathing history a sublime combination of our past and our present. We're at the Ear Inn, resident of the ground floor of the James Brown House and watering hole to the waterfront of Lower Manhattan. Once a pretty sordid area, the Ear Inn now sits just off the intersection of Greenwich and Spring. Not quite Soho, but still finding itself trendy. Though crowded and busy, as it normally is on Friday nights, bartender Gary Collar was nice enough to take a break and tell us about the history of the bar and the building that houses it. Built 1817, and it was um, it was reportedly owned by an aide to uh, Washington by the name of James Brown. He's yeah. in that he's one of the black guy in a very famous photograph of him crossing the Delaware. Gary's talking about this painting, one of the most famous paintings of George Washington. It was done by the 19th century artist Emmanuel Lutz, and it's of Washington crossing the Delaware, and was painted in 1851. In front of the boat, next to Washington, is painted an African American soldier. Now, legend contends that this is James Brown, a Revolutionary War veteran and reportedly an aide to General Washington. Both his existence in the painting and the legend that he was an aide to Washington are speculation. But what we do know is that there was a Revolutionary War vet by the name of James Brown who built this building in 1817. He opened up first a tobacco shop and was apparently very successful at it. In 1833, he sold the building, which was only about five feet from the Hudson at the time. He sold it to Thomas Cloak, who opened a bar on the ground floor. There's been a bar here ever since. Naturally, because of its proximity to the water, its history includes selling liquor and alcohol to nearby passing ships and sailors. It was a pretty rough area, serving both river pirates and the immigrant gangs of New York. And there was even a brothel upstairs at one point. Part of its legacy is seen above the bar in the many large bottles and containers used to store liquor and beer on ships. 
These bottles and the artifacts displayed on the second floor were found in the basement of the building and some of them date back to the 1700s. Gary took us on a quick tour of the top floors of the James Brown House and it's amazingly well preserved. It's got original plank flooring and fireplaces. You really get a sense of what it may have been like so long ago. Like historically speaking, do you know what, what these rooms were devoted to? Brothel. These were brothel rooms. Were they really? Mm -hmm. yeah, the brothels, huh? Yeah, this is the way they're... Yeah. A bit of action going, one, two, three, <laughs> you know, and four. <laughs> This place has got a long, continuous legacy. During Prohibition, the bar was even a speakeasy, with liquor and beer sold out of the second floor. But in the 1970s, the building, by that time a historical landmark, was purchased, and in 1977, Gary's family reopened the bar. But because of landmark restrictions, they couldn't put up a sign, so they got creative. It's a la listed a landmark building, so therefore you're not allowed to touch the front of it, obviously. And there used to be a magazine upstairs called The Ear Inn, and what he did was uh, come up with a brilliant idea of pa painting the bee, making it into an E, and there we oh, have our ear without, gotcha. without touching the front of the building. Does that actually mess up? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that, that works that way. The Ear Inn, and not just the building, has become a landmark in its own right, and a beloved spot that stays crowded most every night by a variety of visitors. It's a very neighborhood crowd. A lot of people have been coming here since before I even got here and I've known them that long. They're still here. A lot, few of them are, quite a few of them have passed, <laughs> right, right. as they do. But, uh... And it's a local crowd that is serious about the bar as a bar. No loud music, no cell phones, just atmosphere. I noticed you had one TV and the volume was all the way down. Yeah, we actually have two. There's one above your head, yeah. Um, we have two, but yeah, we don't put our volume up. It's like for visuals only. So it's more for talking and yeah. hanging out. Exactly. They also serve a short menu of bar and local cuisine. You serve food? We do. Our food is um, very good food actually and it ranges from, uh, you know, appetizers are like from six dollars to eight and uh, our main courses would be from anywhere from ten to twelve and I think we went up to fourteen recently which is like, it's very basic food. Um. We wouldn't call it basic though. We tried the smoked trout, the chicken pie, the steamed mussels, and the shrimp salad, all highly recommended and perfectly combined with their ear in ale. Now, What's the, uh, with the ear in ale? Where, where do you get that from? Uh, that's made that. by Brooklyn. Um, oh. Brooklyn Brewery make that for us. Steve Finley's very good friends with my uncle, and them two guys come up with it and uh, so put they the have ear in. Own recipe just for yeah, you? just for there. We're the only ones that have it. So. And what about sweet foo foo signature drinks? Is there a signature drink that we've got to get when uh, we get here? Find a Guinness and a shot of Jameson. <laughs> he wasn't kidding either. Gary takes this stuff seriously. Cilantro. Today, the small bar, with walls lined with decades worth of decor, is crowded just about every night of the week, with people from every walk of life. With all its history, notoriety, and infamy, this place is just really, really cool. The Erin is like that. It's taken its knocks over the years and served its time serving some of the most undesirable of the city. Now, it's trendy, and it deserves to be trendy. The only hope is that it stays trendy, and stays open for a long, long time. Our tour ends in the Flatiron District at 45 East 18th Street, where we find one of the most beloved bars in New York City. Love, king of New York bars, a place where you can still talk. This is what author Frank McCourt wrote on the dust jacket of his Pulitzer Prize winning memoir, Angela's Ashes. McCourt was writing about his favorite tavern, the place he'd been frequenting since he first started teaching English literature at a high school over on 16th Street. He was talking about Old Town Bar, on East 18th Street in New York City. What makes someone so sentimental about a bar? I mean, after all, an author only has so much room on the dust jacket of a book. To really understand why McCourt was so enamored of this place, you'd have to go here yourself. But in the absence of that, we'll try our best to help you understand by first getting the history of Old Town Bar from the owner, Gerard Meeker. 
And this building was built in 1892, and, and it was originally a, a German uh, place called V Meisters, and, uh, and then they, they ran it for about 20 years. That makes this place not only old, but a New York landmark. Imagine all that it's seen, all that's been through this place. What's more is that the date puts Old Town Bar into a small click of the city's most historical watering holes that deserve respect, especially considering they made it through the darkest years of our nation's history, Prohibition. During the Prohibition, it, it was called Craig's Restaurant, and so uh, and Tammany Hall was a couple blocks away from here. New York didn't really um, didn't really um, accept Prohibition. You know, it was a lot of German, Irish in New York in those days, and, and their tradition was uh, was uh, not to um, to abide by prohibition. Disguising themselves as Craig's Restaurant, the bar went about business as usual, taking advantage of a special feature built into their booths. And so like these booths, the booth you're sitting in pulls out and they, they would put the liquor underneath there during that time for the faux raids that they would have. So thanks to some simple hiding places, Craig's Restaurant survived prohibition and then reopened. So then after prohibition, it opened as the old town, you know, it was okay. the, Loden family, who were German Americans, Klaus Klaus Loden was the owner, and um, and Klaus lived to about 1952, and um, and it was you know specialized in German food basically in this area. I mean, there was a lot of German. Luchau's is a very famous place, a couple of blocks from here, um, and uh, so Klaus died in '52, and then he um, his son Henry took took it over. But this neighborhood started to decline between the 50s and, and 60s, and, and um, New York declined in the 60s. Yeah. Like so many taverns do, Old Town fell on hard times when the dynamics of their neighborhood and the city itself changed. The regular, homogenized crowd of German Americans moved out of the area. But as luck would have it, Gerard's father, who hadn't had a whole lot of success with bars in Brooklyn, made Old Town his final stand, and it proved to be his biggest payoff. My father kind of took it over, you know, with Henry, and Henry was not a great, uh, he, yeah, he was more interested in playing bridge than running the bar, you know, so, uh, so my father kind of had experience running bars uh, in Brooklyn, you know, where he made his mistakes, so when he was in Manhattan, he was ready for uh, the big time, so he started opening up at nights, and, you know, and then this area started to uh, regenerate, and, uh, and then uh, it started to uh, advance from there. Right. And so, that, so here you are. So here we are. Yeah. And so here they are, loved by fans throughout New York, but especially, as McCord implied, a particular literary crowd. We celebrate writers. I mean, my father kind of had a little writing interest. I mean, I was always an editor in high school and college, a paper. So, I, I mean, I, I admire writers and, and uh, and we've been fortunate to have some, you know, very interesting writers. I mean, Brian Friel, a great Irish playwright, and came in one time with Seamus Heaney, the great Irish poet. And, and you know, we, and we even get English writers, Nick Hornby, and, and, uh, and people of that sort. So they feel comfortable here because it's, 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 it's a place that celebrates conversation. Celebrating conversation. What a wonderful way to describe this place. No loud music, no blaring TVs, no cell phones just conversation. So why did Frank McCourt gush about a bar on the dust jacket of his best-selling book? It's because the bar was Old Town Bar, a place where you can get lost in 55 feet of mahogany and marble, where you can sit and be alone with your thoughts amongst a hundred other people. Or it's a place where you can talk to the attorney on one side or the retired cop on the other, and you can talk without shouting. Simply put, Old Town Bar is one of those places they don't make anymore, often imitated, but never, ever duplicated a place that increasingly only exists in the pages of books by talented writers like McCord himself.